Well, folks, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. We've got a long list of people who perform here today, uh, and the, uh, one of the reasons we do this is because we don't have many opportunities to see each other and hear each other. But uh, so we're, we're here. We're glad to do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When you come, oh, there you go. When you uh, when you come up and, and read, as most, some of you know, they have to say, eat the mic, and that is true. I can tell. So, uh, and, and if you're going to visit, I understand why well, you might like to, but do that in the outside there, uh, if you would, please. You have a little conversation, you want to keep, keep going somehow, just wander on out there like you're going to have a smoke, you know. You wouldn't smoke in here, so you won't visit in here either, and that'll, that'll be fine. You know, we've got 30, uh, 33 or so people, and we'd like to get out of here in a couple of hours, and uh, if... 33 people take three minutes a piece. That gives us just enough time to make the transitions and things. And uh, I, you know, I could tell you how long three minutes is going to be, just if you need a, tar a target. We've been better and better. It's taken us 22 tries to uh, understand what the limits are. But uh, uh, we all appreciate. Uh, uh, those who are able to get up and give us a quick something and, and get on and make room for somebody else, you know. So we've all enjoyed 15-minute sp uh, spots over the weekend and long leisurely conversations. This is not really the place for that because we want to hear from at least 33, and I'm sure there'll be others who want to sign up and then get out of here by noon or so. So we, we could stay till 4, I'm sure, if we if we went at the pace uh, that we kind of would like to. Um, I think I have a couple of announcements, and one of the most important ones is Pat Dixon is uh, every year taking a, a group photo of those who linger and hang on, and some folks that I believe already today, but uh, if you uh, are still with us uh, immediately after this, uh, uh, this farewell, then uh, Pat, where would you like people to meet? I think we'll go outside where there's, where there's more light, so maybe, uh, maybe out the front. Out in yeah, 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 we'll, we'll let readers, yeah, readers only. Talking. Yeah. Why don't we all? Why don't we all congregate out? Uh, just, uh, I don't, yeah, I would think. Here, okay, here's yeah. Okay, Pat will think about it. Having been a school teacher himself, and me having been a school teacher, we understand a lot of things can go wrong trying to move a group of people from one place to another. Yeah, I think the shortest distance between it would be. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll be doing that afterwards, and so don't die. We can take care of that quickly. Uh, the gear shack is locked up. You know, I could have made it more. Uh, uh, mm, uh, clear that, that it's not open today, but it is. Uh, when this is over, I'll go over there and open it up, and uh, uh, and and y'all can pick up the stuff that you've left. And uh, I don't think my wife Doreen is going to come down. Uh, you know, I uh, I just am so grateful for her help. She is the gr grease in your gears. Yeah, I'll, I should I should dial her up right now and just. Uh, do you want to try that? She may still be asleep, but she doesn't sleep that much. Watch this. I'm taking, this is way longer than three minutes. Let's, let's see if this works. No, just give her a cheer. Uh, phone number, four and five. Four, three, four. The speed dial doesn't work for me. Now, knowing Doreen, she's, she gets up every week at 4.30 to drive down to Tillamook to teach second graders and gets home about 7 o'clock. You can't imagine, I mean, it's embarrassing how hard she works. Hi, love. Say, um, I have some people who'd like to say thank you. There you go. She just, uh... Okay, she says she loves you all and she's, she's recovering. Thank you. Okay, see ya. Oh, you know, and some of us say we don't like technology. Oh, well, thanks so much. That really, that, that, you just saved my ass. Whew. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, the limit, we were talking three minutes, and three minutes goes by pretty fast. And so we came up, so it wasn't me, somebody had a great idea. Maybe it was Rich King. Uh, at three minutes, or three minutes and five seconds, I'm going to start to clap, and that means your time is is over. And I would like everybody else to clap with me. And don't leave me. 
alone. Because it really is, a, uh, as an MC, the, my, the greatest fear for me is to have to pull somebody who's doing something great and enthusiastic, and even the crowd is into it, but time is up, and we gotta, we got to get out of the water. You know, most of us who are commercial fishermen know that. So, <laughs> we're going to be fine. Our, our first person is uh, Bruce Jones, mayor of the uh, city of Astoria. Morning. I have to take off my uh, Fisher Poet participant hat real quick, put on my mayor hat. I just want to thank John and Jay and all the volunteers and the board members and all of the participants um, for this wonderful festival that you put on. The city of Astoria appreciates it so very much. And as we, uh, as we fight hard to retain our unique uh, heritage as a, as a fishing and a historic town and not become uh, another coastal tourist town, this is such a key part of that. So thank all of you. How about a round of applause for the whole team? I, I started flying Coast Guard helicopter search and rescue about 35 years ago. And at that time, if we were looking for you at night, you didn't have flares and lights, or if your boat had sunk and you were treading water, man, you were out of luck. And then came along night vision goggles. They changed everything, saved a lot of lives. So I think a, a poem about night vision goggles is uh, the most romantic thing you could have. <laughs> on, a, on a moonless, cloudless night, far from land and warm bed, the star-filled sky stretches limitless through the plexiglass overhead. But seen through night vision goggles, which turn a thousand stars to a million and reveal a secret world invisible to the naked eye of shooting stars and satellites. And even on rare nights, shimmering northern lights, a whale spout just once, gulls and turns in abundance, pot floats pelicans by the hundreds, appearing clear as day, resting on the pitch black ocean 500 feet below. It's always jaw-dropping, and I relish the otherworldly scenes as we journey through solitary skies over lonely seas, sights unimagined by those outside our small society. Miracle optics that amaze me still, originally designed to find and kill unsuspecting foes on the battlefield, now in our hands instead reveal your wake, your rigging, your boots and clothes. Keep me from flying into the ocean at 2 a.m., hoisting a dewatering pump to your leaking, listing trawler. Or, if we arrive too late, give us hope to find you floating in the briny blue. If there's a bit of moon or even just starlight, then every bit of debris floating on the sea is visible through green-tinted lens. And you, for whom we will search through the night and long hours as if you were our own family, will do all in our powers to bring you home to yours. Thank you. Schoonmaker, Erica, Jeff, Lori, Mark, uh, uh, Abigail, Ed, Nancy Cook, Rob, and then Doreen. That's 10. Thank you, Astoria. I love coming down here 12 times now. This one's called Stay. Opens a sky of pink and gray blue. Glitters of frost that last week was due. Showered in leaves as breezes come through. So ends the summer. What's grown is what grew. My boat's on a trailer, my net's in a bag. I made it back safely, not much to brag. I've seen better summers and I know I've seen worse. I'm kind of a winner, it's just there's no purse. I picked out a fair jag and I made some nice sets. Not much for mama, but paid up some debts. Some people see trouble with fishing today. When talking with me, they ask why I stay. We call it our lifestyle, that's why we stay. And that's why we borrow and hope we can pay. You know, it's gotten a lot tougher, but then so have I. With lower expectations, I just live on this pie. But there's still nothing like it. My hand on the wheel. I'm not leased by a boss. I don't have to heal. I'm out in the scenes on some beautiful bay. I'm paid for my troubles in more than one way. Go think like a salmon and try to go back to thinking like a goldfish. You know where I'm at. <laughs> Maybe I'll stay broke. What can I say? At least I'm not broken. That's why I stay. That's a tough act to follow Steve every time. Ugh. I'm Erica. I moved to Astoria from Cordova uh, just this summer. And uh, I was born and raised in Kodiak. And 
This is a poem about my experience with the Exxon Valdez oil spill. I sat under the stairs all day for weeks. In 1989, my mom worked as an expediter with another fisherman's wife out of a home office on the side of Pillar Mountain overlooking my hometown of Kodiak, Alaska. You could see the harbors and you could see the canneries and you could feel the doom. I was four years old, almost five and I sat under the stairs day in and day out after my morning preschool. Sometimes I got picked up for play dates, but most of the time I played under the stairs. The house we were at, a family friend's, was home to a teenage girl and a little brother. The little brother wasn't very friendly, he didn't share his toys, and he had a reputation for being a bit of a spoiled brat. About six years later, that same little boy and that same teenage girl lost their father when their boat sank and all hands were lost at sea. But that April, I sat under the stairs and I brought my bag of toys and I listened to my mom rattle off lists of groceries and boom and hoses and tubing and didn't know what it all meant. All I knew was that it was important and it kept her so busy and it meant we couldn't go to the beach, we couldn't go play at Fort Abercrombie, we weren't going out to lunch, and we weren't spending casual afternoons drawing or painting or planting seedlings. No, that April I sat under the stairs and I listened. And I listened to my mother and I listened to this other mom talk about what this would do for our futures to our fisheries and what the long-term decimation of a fishery might look like. So hopeful that maybe, just maybe, it wouldn't touch our shores, wouldn't coat our beaches like it had Prince William Sound, that it would miss us, that it wouldn't coat the water's surface like the black tar that it did over there smothering a season's run of herring row, a fishing industry that they had both partaken in many years ago before becoming mothers and wives and expediters in this moment. I sat under the stairs and I listened. As a young woman, I went back to school for a master's degree and I got one in education and counseling. And I wrote my thesis on how the psychosocial impacts of human-caused technological disasters affect the social and emotional and mental health of adolescent youth. Because like me, there were so many of my generation and about half a dozen years older that sat under the stairs or around the kitchen tables and watched their parents as the devastation of our fisheries was foreshadowed in the darkness of the oil as it rolled up on our beaches. Many of our families would never recover. Many families would suffer from depression, alcoholism, and other forms of substance abuse to cope with the loss of a livelihood, the loss of an industry, the loss of a lifestyle. My entire generation would be told to go to college, get a degree, don't rely on fishing. And many of us would. Many of us would leave fishing and because our predecessors told us that it was not something to depend on anymore and because we had witnessed the fallout of a cataclysmic event in fisheries history and it would take us years to return home to those waters. I sat under the stairs and I listened. When I started fishing, there weren't nearly as many ladies, women. The other half of our species was not included in the fisheries very often, but there were some, and this one's to them. And this one's called One of the Guys. Okay. She didn't look like much striding down the dock pugnacious as a bulldog with her jaw thrust out and her rolling walk. Couldn't have weighed a hundred pounds with her dirty car hearts thrown in. <laughs> but she came well recommended from the same boat where she'd been. The halibut derby, a day away, we're baiting at full speed. Well, okay, we'll, we'll give you a try. You can't cost much to feed. <laughs> she pitched in tying ganyans, a whiz at sharpening hook. But when lunchtime came, she set us straight. <laughs> I may be a girl, but I don't cook. When we started pulling back the gear, bucking a nasty chop, she was sure-footed, quick on the deck like a Texas League shortstop, gutting the butts, pulling the nuts, 
even on a big barn door. Never a wasted motion, like she'd done all this before. And when we landed a big lively one, arching and thumping and kicking, she'd attack with the back of the gaff like a blood-crazed berserk Viking. <laughs> Till he lay there, stunned and quivering, twice as big as her. Then her knife went in, and the gut spilled out, and she looked around for more. When we had him iced down in the hold, and we're running back to town, she stood a five-hour wheel watch so us guys could all lie down. <laughs> Up at the bar, it drinks all around from another long line crew when one of their deck apes smirks and says, you took a girl with you? She didn't say a word, just flipped him the bird. <laughs> Went on with her drinking. I stood us all another round, and then I got to thinking. I said, you pulled more than your weight out there in the sound. But if you really want to be one of the guys, you'll need to buy a round. <laughs> This is going to be quick. This is a, a song that celebrates family fishermen. It's abbreviated so we can do it in three minutes. And some of you heard me sing it this weekend and you already know the chorus. So we'll get started, okay? Yeah. Sarah rose through the waves, sailing out to the sea. Carrying a net full of our hopes and the dreams of a family. She's a full sail, she's the one that we all love. Rising, rosin' and rockin', Sarah carry us home. Carry us home. window is frosty, the radar spins round and round, the coffee's burnt and it's too hot, the autopilot is down, the net is coming back loaded, there are seagulls nearby, we're done our fishing, Sarah carry us home. The wishes that we carry makes being out here so great That our loved ones are cared for and their dreams they are met We all want good weather, we want a lot of fish out here We're heading to the west, Sarah carry us home Last chorus, here we go. Riding on the ocean, turning with the tide. Hauling in that net, 
our friends by our side. another of Smitty's uh, signature poems and um, Rick uh, Rich King from uh, Hawaii, 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 Hawaii said that he thought that this was the, the best poem that he had ever heard mm -hmm. and he used to recite it because he liked it so much so this is um, this is Smitty's poem it's called the ballad of rubber hooks divine According to a fisherman whose name was Divine, the world's a cafeteria. You get one trip through the line. <laughs> With this fact then planted firmly in his mind, he set his sights on having the best that he could find. He was always dreaming of a life of luxury, but the way that things were going was likely not to be because in order to accomplish these somewhat lofty goals, he sorely needed every fish that bent his trolling poles. So long and loud he would complain when a fish slipped off the line. Consequently, he was known as a rubber hook's divine. By unjust fate or foul luck, lost fish his dreams were thwarted, resulting in domestic when he'd rather have imported. Resigned to screw top bottles, no cork stoppered stuff. Be damned those fish that got away making his life tough. He had a box of crackers, but no beluga caviar. And a beat up old Chevy, but no fancy German car. Quality of life in intricate design. Those were serious matters for Rubber Hook's divine. He had a lot of friends among the other trollers, but of course included were no mega bucks high rollers. So when a cruise ship bound for Sitka happened by to pass, he seized this opportunity <laughs> to view the upper class. Rubber Hook's maneuvered as close as he dared to sail. A real nice looking lady was waving from the rail. A diamond necklace round her throat had slipped its fragile clasp. Tragically, it fell away despite her frantic grasp. Diamonds sparkled in the sun as they plunged into the brine and by chance became entangled on his portside bow line. <laughs> now, Rubber Hooks was trolling a diamond-studded lure that no salmon could resist, and that was for sure, because there was an instant stretching of a spring. The diamond lure was inhaled by a 35-pound king. <laughs> How Rubber Hooks crossed his fingers and put the girdie in gear that this fish might depart was his greatest fear. Oh yes, he got the fish with those diamonds on the hook. He clutched onto the necklace and off for Sitka town he took. Well, on the way he was overcome by the strangest feeling. If he kept and sold this necklace, in fact, he would be stealing. So he approached the cruise ship office and he left this note. I found a diamond necklace and I've got it on my boat. I want to return it because it isn't mine. I'm tied up to the fishing float, signed Rubber Hooks Divine. While he was cooking summer from the cabin door, knocking Rubber Hooks looked up and what he saw was shocking. The same good-looking lady that was on the cruise ship deck, she sure looked good to Rubber Hooks despite no diamonds round her neck. Come in, I've got your necklace and a seat please take. I'm just fixing supper here, have some salmon steak. So they became acquainted as they began to dine on salmon steak and fried potatoes washed down with screw top bottle wine. The lady was impressed and she began to feel that she'd never met a better man nor had a better meal. She said, I'm really jealous of the life you lead, so what I'm really hoping is a partner you might need. A deal was promptly made that fulfilled both their wishes. Rubber hooks whistled, tying gear, and she sang while washing dishes. So from then on, they fished together, and although his nickname stuck, never more was Rubber Hooks heard to curse his luck. <laughs> I just wanted to tell you that this was written on February 25th, 1999, the day before Fisher Poets Gathering. <laughs>I am. I am the boat that has carried men to sea each day since he crafted board to board, cocked the in-between long before Odysseus' sight of home.
was blown to foreign shores, troubled by deeds of war, sickened deep into his bones. I am the boards that separate you from cold, dark ocean currents, curls, and breakers. Those breakers that challenge each board to remain in place, each man-made seam to hold fast. I am the oaken boards that shape your home. I am the vessel of your beginning, your launch in life, the secret of your soul burdened with a day's reality. Fish or cargo, men or munitions. In yesteryears you clung to planks to tide your journeys from shore to shore. I am today that vessel of fiberglass or steel, though some still make me with wooden knees. I am that woman lying on her back who holds you in the belly of her curves, supports you when you stand on deck. I am the tissue between you and the murk of black water and the blank space of nothingness, that thin line of place that keeps your body in oxygen keeps you alive as the beams creak and threaten, holds you fast, preserves your cold hands and beating heart. You trust me as I support your life and skills. You rely on me to keep board and beam knit together, rely on me to hold you safe. I am the wood and the caulk, the steel and the rivets, I am your survival. Thank you. I'm the right size to build everything too big. <laughs> <laughs> I need your help. I'm gonna go like this, make noise like a snake. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> we had such a wonderful um, weekend. But I know you got a mean face, all right? <laughs> like you missed a big one. Didn't catch enough. Didn't make ends meet. Put your mean face on and do snake. Long time ago, there was a young man named Snake. Had arms and legs. Snake liked to run races. Snake liked to climb trees. But most of all, Snake liked to jump off the cliffs into sand. If Snake didn't like anything, he would say, Brother, sister did something for Snake. Snake didn't like it. He would say, Auntie or uncle did something for snake. Snake didn't like it, he would say. If his mother or father did something for snake. Snake didn't like it, he would say. Even if his grandma or grandpa did something for snake. Snake didn't like it, he would say. One day the village went to another village to hunt, trade, and fish. Snake ran the race. He lost. He told the other racers they fixed him something to eat. Could have been a bowl of salmon eyeball soup. Mmm. <laughs> if you didn't like it, they tell the cooks. But told them a story like I'm telling you, a new and different story. If you didn't like it, they tell the storyteller. They sang him a new song. He didn't like it, they tell the singers. What do we do about that snake? He makes us ashamed to go visit. In the way the visit is polite. You eat what you're given. You don't act rude. What do you do about that snake every time he loses a race, he says. Eat someone he doesn't like, he says. Listen to a song he doesn't like. Listen to a story he doesn't like, he says. All the time, he says. That night, it was quiet in the village. Everyone was asleep. The medicine woman snuck in the snake's lodge. She took out a knife, cut up snake's arm. Put Indian medicine on him and healed up. Cut off Snake's leg. Put Indian medicine on him and healed up. Cut off Snake's other arm. Put Indian medicine on him and healed up. Cut off Snake's leg. Put Indian medicine on him and healed up. Everyone get your hands up. All night that night, the people in the village, they rolled Snake. Rolled Snake. Rolled Snake. Rolled Snake. And sang a magic song. Help me say it, everyone. All night they... Rolled Snake. And sing a magic song all night they And sing a magic song all night they And sing 
Rose Magic Song all night they Rose 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 And sing a magic song all night they Rose 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 Sing a magic song all night they Rose 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 Boy that's a long night huh <laughs> <laughs> All night they Rose 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 And see magic song how snake was long and round. You know how snakes look today? Yeah. And he threw them down and he slithered, waving these people's feet. Snakes they remember what people did to them long, long time ago. What do snakes say when they see human beings nowadays? Thank you. <laughs> As humans, we have our way of singing at people, use our prestige, power, how much fish we got, how much money we got. So we really shouldn't shh at each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Yeah. I'm Nancy Cook Astoria. I could uh, spend my whole three minutes talking about what a blessing it is to be Ed's homestay. He told that story to my daughter Izzy's class on Friday. And they got to watch him dance at the last salmon feast, uh, Salilo Falls last salmon feast. You can find that online too. Dancing in his fruit of the looms at age 10. <laughs> and he's still dancing at 10 p.m. on Fridays. But I got an abbreviated song. Important to say that the Tyson in this a uh, little Diddy is not a person. He's not a cool Fisher Poet deckhand. He is a corporation and he is not a person. So, here we go. I hope you'll sing with me. 25 years since I went to sea to see Tyson kill fish indiscriminately. That broke my heart. And I realized then what I still know now that we need better ways and we need them right now. Oh, we need the whole green deal. And I wake in the morning to my NPR, hear the new lie, let out a big sigh and I scream at the top of my lungs, what's going on? And I say, hey, hey, I say, hey, hey, I say, hey, what's going on? We need a new green deal. We need to let this world heal. We need to let ourselves feel. We need to let ourselves feel. What's really going on? This isn't us versus them. This is sink or swim. We got just one life that's all, and we better climb in. Whoa. <laughs> and roll like hell to shore. We need to slow down, not frown, just be sound and do the right thing. Each and every day, we can be the new way. We need to think new and redo and be through with all of this doo-doo. <laughs> we are the whole green deal. We need to let this world heal. And I say, hey, hey, hey. If we're not fighting for solutions, then we're part of the problem. I don't mean to be down-thumbed. It's just the truth. And I pray. Oh, my God, it's do I pray. I pray every single day for a revolution. Not just of institutions, 
but you and me living consciously. 25 years and my life is still trying to get up that great big hill of hope to our destination. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being part of Solutions. It's not always hard to do the right thing. I've been wearing this shirt for three days and it's starting to stink like fish, but a lot of our Fisher Poets in this room are part of Amazing Solutions. One of them's coming up. Please talk to your neighbors. Vote with your voice throughout the year. Do the right thing. Thank you. Man, what a weekend, huh? <laughs> Sometimes I wish I was brave enough to try singing. Yeah. Fortunately for you guys, I'm not. <laughs> I have a short one here. Uh, I guess this is about uh, letting the things you can control help you deal with the ones you can't. I call it paints cheap. Paints cheap. For a hundred dollars a can, you can turn the old new again. A two-part epoxy facelift. One pass of the roller, blemishes and imperfections disappear. With the proper amount of prep work, dull and cracked will become smooth and shiny. Let the needle scaler chip away at the problem areas. When you're done painting, it's important to step back and admire your work. Take a minute to appreciate the freshly painted perfection of your net reel, say. Because, you know, as soon as you use it, it will begin its slow path of degradation back to the state that caused you to paint it in the first place. <laughs> but for that moment, let those things you can't control slip away. Because maybe you can't change the weather or fishery politics. And maybe your bouts with optimism are less frequent these days. But right now, your net reel is flawless. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, probably a lot of you have, have uh, heard my stories. Uh, this is a little bit serious, and I've been wanting to do this. Is this okay? I've been wanting to do this uh, the last couple times, but there's hundreds of stories to be told. Each one of you has one, and this is another option you might think about. Though we all want to leave stories to our families of our adventures in the fisheries, some of us get overwhelmed thinking about memoirs and long books, so we never do it. I found a way one winter. I wrote a Christmas story for my great-grandchildren as a present, and I read it to them. My daughter said, Mom, you need to make this into a children's book. Since then, I have written seven children's books, all of them about Alaska and children. Most of them have to do with fishing, and I have done a cross-generational thing. I have put their great-grandpa in it, Captain Ed Bilderback, who was a legend, a hunter, trapper, and fisherman from Cordova. They never knew him, but I put the great-grandchildren, the grandchildren, all of them in the stories, too. They are all together in there now. Whenever they read the story, great-grandfather, great-grandsons, even mom and dad, I find it a way to leave my stories to my family and show up to four generations. Just a thought. I self-publish my stories. I sell them in gift shops in Alaska. Each one is personal and each one is true, mostly anyway. 
If any of you would like to know more about how to self-publish, it's easy to do, it's simple, it's fun. And you are leaving a legacy. Telling stories that might never be heard by your children, grandchildren, and their children. I brought some books for you to look at to see how easy it is. I go to Kindle Direct Publishing, they walk you through it. See me if you're interested, I'd be glad to help you any way I could. I'm 85 years old now and I started this when I was 82. They have been a joy to me to, and my family. I've had such a wonderful, adventurous life and sharing some of my stories with you at the Poet Fisher Gatherings have been one of the highlights of my life and I thank you for that privilege. The era I lived through is gone, but the stories we write live on. See you all again next year. It's really simple to move the microphone up and down just for your information. Well, I'm sure I'll be an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> My name's Hope Kiter. I'm from Astoria. I look forward to this weekend all year, and I'm never disappointed. I actually work in this building. My office is in that direction upstairs in the oldest part of the building, which they jacked up when they put the Columbia River Packers Association cold storage unit down here. I work in an office trying to keep my fishermen in their jobs. Thank you. Here, here, yeah. yes. But what I'd like to share with you is a remembrance of somebody that I met when I came to work at this building. He was one of our cherished old timers who's now gone over the horizon. His name was uh, Gosh, Ken, no, Chuck, uh, Thompson, uh, Thompson, in any case, Chris Thompson. And Chris came to work in this building when it was the um, Columbia River Packers Association cold storage unit. And he worked down at the far end of this building where the Rogue Pub is now. And he was a master filleter, and he split huge sides of salmon to lay carefully in great big barrels called tierces, and laying them between layers of, uh, of salt. And they would put eight or nine hundred pounds of these great big summer Chinook, uh, which locally we knew as June hogs. They were fish that were pumpkin seed shaped and uh, they grew to be at least 50 pounds and the largest of them uh, topped 100 pounds and they were the basis for the the trade in mild cure salmon which went in refrigerated cars from Astoria here to New York where they were the basis of the locks that people ate with their bagels in the morning and many of them were shipped over to Europe for uh, similar uses there. In any case, um, those June hogs were extirpated when the federal government put in Grand Coulee Dam. And um, I saw Chris at a meeting uh, in subsequent years and I said, you know, I just read the National Marine Fisheries Service status report on Mid-Columbia Summer Chinook, and it says in there, in this document written in 1995, there is no empirical evidence that any such large species of fish as the June hog ever existed. <laughs> And he began to shake and he said it's terrible I fleet them with my own hands who would you believe a long time ago I knew a family in Spencer, just up the river from here. 
I knew a family in Svensson just up the river from here. It's really easy. And, and they were, just, yeah, there you go. And the man who does it easily is doing it now, and I'm grateful. Um, they had a church that taught that God made the fish, God made the river, God did not make the dams. Yeah. Some of you know this one. My grandfather's river fed every family in town. Fish ran through our bloodline. Deep, steady, and sound. Deep, steady, and sound. Deep, steady, and sound. High up in the mountains, this creeks tumble and join. Many songs come together. Spring and fall, fattened up in the ocean, they make the forest tall. My grandfather's river ran strong and clean through mountains and canyons. She gathered the stream all the way down. She watered the land, touched every valley. Song of the highlands, song of the sea, they meet at the river mouth, and they make a symphony, song may go quiet, fish may not always come around, this river she's waiting, deep, steady and sound. Deep, steady, and sound. Thank you. I want to call out the work that our friends here, that actually everyone here, is doing to make sure that the ocean still makes fish and the rivers still make fish. Hope, you're a champion. Yes. Brad, you're a champion. You all, all of you are. Thank you all. I, I had to arm wrestle Brad and I lost, so I have to follow him. And then I had to arm wrestle Clem and I lost, so I have to come before him. Consequently, my name doesn't matter. This is called Meditation Before Setting the Net. Let the wind be clouded with birds. I will send my gear deep. Let the wind rip open the surface of abyss and let the black be torn to snow under wings that lays on albatross make fast to wind. I will set main wire to rumble, reeling off drums, winches unspooling as my trawl pulls. Let me ramp my revolutions per minute, one piston at a time, burning diesel and my wheel turning till each blade of that propeller slices darkness to white. Let the wind bear fulmers beyond counting. Let the wind flourish glaucous-winged gulls as if pennants whipped the length of frontiers, marking that boundary between feather and salt. I will send my foot rope as low as mud. 
I will weather my foot rope through sand. Let gravel abrade chain and shackle. I will haul back turn by turn on the main winches. Let wind salt the taste of the invisible into ritual bitching of quick-handed sailors, their tongues working sharper than the serrations honed upon their wicked little knives. <laughs> Let the flavor of prayer, which is the rich flavor of sweat, gust in the mouth as deckhands kneel in the trawl alley, knotting broken meshes, or seizing blasphemies to breast lines, every in-breath that they hitch stitched sweeter than the sweetest obscenity aimed at a skipper or at a shipmate or at God. I will witness the witchery of mariners who are only at home at sea. I will witness their casting of splices into cable let them yank net needles till elbows ache. Let their benzels clinch the cod end tight where one of my rib lines parted has been hammer locked whole chain link by chain link. Let the wind wash over my hands as they wield small sledges and fids and thimbles. Let the wind be clouted by birds. Let the wind be harvest and harvester. <coughs> Let the wind carve kitty wakes from wind. I will send my gear to the dark. Let the wind be sonar and sound my tow path, echoes falling fathom upon fathom. Bravo. I'm Clem Stark. I'm from the East Coast originally. I came to the Northwest the first time 60, 65 years ago. I rode in on a freight train into Southern Oregon from Utah. Wound up working on a railroad section gang in Eastern Oregon. This poem I'm gonna read draws on that experience. It's called Long Creek, Walla Walla. We'd be drinking at a bar in La Grande on a Saturday night, a few of us from the Duncan section, when all of a sudden somebody'd say, let's go to Long Creek. So we'd pile into the back of his pickup and drive for hours through the vast sagebrush scented Eastern Oregon night. till we came to a cluster of buildings, a tavern at a crossroads in the middle of nowhere. Not a whole lot was happening in the Long Creek Tavern, which later I learned was called by the locals a pastime. Jukebox silent, pool table deserted. One lone cowboy and the barmaid palavering. I was trying to figure why we had come there <laughs> and what it all meant. <laughs> I was new to the West, and distances were improbable. Well, who knows what it meant, and who knows where it was we went from there. Back to work on Monday morning, tamping ballast, lining track, maintaining the 20 miles of Union Pacific roadbed known as the Duncan section. Other weekends, it'd be different. We'd be drinking at a bar in Pendleton, and suddenly somebody'd say, let's go to Walla Walla. <laughs> so I'm David Bean. I, like uh, Clam, sailed in the Merchant Marine in the 60s. Uh, I'd fished before then. I uh, fished first time out, way outside, 200 miles, was for albacore off of Mexico. And the long lining was mixed with the seining back then. Because seining was new. And uh, we were just working things out. So that's one thing, and that'll refer to this 
Well, no. It's a way of referring to this poem, because when you're catching fish one by one, and you see people catching them in a crowd, <coughs> it gets you thinking. <laughs> and, uh, in, you know, Oregon had a pretty damn uh, smoky summer this year. And uh, that's because uh, we've gone past the uh, chainsaw, which was cutting them one by one. Now we have the feller bunchers. Anybody here heard a feller buncher? They go, nyeh. That's a tree. That's what a tree sounds like. Nyeh. So uh, we have to be aware of what we're doing as our deep forest soil that held the water of these trees so tall that were big tanks of water that orbited around in their little environment that kept it cool uh, for the salmon uh, and also that stopped fires. So uh, I'm, I, I'm really concerned about us burning up. So I have this little, I, does anybody remember my short poem from last year? No, nobody? Here it comes, it's gonna come again. This is the shortest poem. Um, it's called Too Much Wasabi. I Cry. Uh, uh, I, I have one that's a little longer than that. It's called, uh, well, it doesn't have a name yet, but it's, it said, uh, people who treat trees like grass have their head stuck up their ass. <laughs> so um, this one's called hauling net. Hand over hand, fishermen have a grip like no other. Having pulled net over the gunnel for a thousand years, some strength develops in the hands of a fisherman. The power block of a sane boat can apply 500 horses to that task, done by hand for centuries stacked. How long will this last? How long will these schools last with all this power and technology? Call me a romantic, but there is more respect to catching big fish one by one when the big fish run. Catching them that way is a hell of a lot more fun. Yeah. Thank you.